Um, all right. So um, in this today's webinar, um, I'm going to first uh, walk you through building some basic uh, time series, and I'm going to sh I'm going to tell you kind of principles of thinking <laughs> about building a chart in particular time series chart, but charts and metabase in general. And then um, we'll go through some uh, best practices of representing time series data in a variety of forms. So um, here on the uh, on this little dashboard, I have for you uh, a bunch of ways uh, to represent time series data. So first of all, okay, maybe I should start with what is time series data? By uh, time series data, I mean, um, uh, let me just create a question, a, a summary, like, for example, sum of total when and it's grouped by uh, date. Uh, by the way, uh, in Metabase, it's super convenient to change the granularity of date. I absolutely love it that I can just click on this button. Um, I, I've told uh, this in the previous webinar, but I used to be a pure SQL user, um, and this is... Uh, uh, like the, my second favorite thing about the query builder, first one being, being uh, out of binning, that I don't need to remember like what is exactly the date truncation function called in whatever database I'm working with today and like go and change the granularity. So that's, uh, that's fantastic. So a time series is just a metric that is summarized by date. And... Uh, uh, Metabase has a bunch of ways uh, to represent this. The classic one is a line chart. That's what you get if you just build a summary by date and and visualize it. That's a line chart. And uh, you can add a trend line to get exactly what I have over here. But there are other options like uh, bar and area charts that I talked about before. Uh, one of my favorite ones is a trend chart. We call it trend chart, but really it's just like displaying a single number and how it compares to previous periods. There are also other ways to display period comparisons, like putting a year-over-year -year chart where I put the data from, like, say, last year and this year broken out by months on a single chart. Um, you can also build a waterfall chart. Um, it has kind of very limited applications uh, and why we'll talk about later. And uh, everyone's favorite, you can just build a table. That is always, you can always just build a table, just a regular table or a pivot table if you have uh, more dimensions to present information in just like as, as much detail as possible. So um, the first thing I want to kind of impart on you uh, from this webinar, there will be two things. Um, one of them is that any chart should communicate only one thing but we'll get to it later. And the second thing is that uh, a chart is not, a chart is your goal, right? But it's not how you should think about your data. Uh, a chart is just a presentation layer that's sitting on top of uh, some kind of table of results. And that's why we give you this option at the bottom of the screen to switch between results and a chart. And a single, table of results can have multiple visualizations. For example, I can have a line chart, I can have a bar chart, I can have an area chart, or I can have a trend chart. But they are all built, or I can have a waterfall chart, right? They're all built on the same table. Now, why, why is this important? Because when you think about what chart you want to build, you should start with what will my data look like for the chart that I want to build? Every chart works with these uh, time series differently. If I take a line chart, it just takes every value and plots them on a line. So does the bar chart. Uh, the waterfall chart works a bit differently. It, it plots these numbers sequentially, but all the bars are kind of starting where the previous bar ends. So they're stacked on top of each other. And trend chart does something entirely different. It takes a table that looks like this, um, 
looks at the very last value in the table. Look at this 3759 April 2026. You know, MetaBase is living in the future. Uh, so does our sample data. Uh, so uh, it takes the very last value in your results table and just compares it to the previous value. Or in the trend chart setting, you can actually control um, comparing it maybe to two months ago. And you can add another one to maybe six months ago. Right? So it's still working on the same data set as your line chart, but it's doing an addit additional logic. Take the last row and look up one of the previous rows and which previous row is specified by the comparison setting. So, and the reason I'm telling you this because you might, if you think from the results perspective rather than from the chart perspective, this can help answer a lot of questions about like, how do I build the chart that I want? So let's say I have a trend chart and uh, let's maybe I'll change it breaking out by week instead of months and say, okay, this is great, but you know what I want? I want these comparisons to be um, previous week and the second comparison to be previous months. Why I want this, I don't know, but how do I build this? Well, I need to think about what my results will be because my, my uh, trend chart just looks at the last row of the table and then pulls some previous value. I would need to have the previous value for like a week and a month in the same table. But how do I do that, right? Because, well, then I have to like break out by week and a month, um, which, by the way, is uh, currently, I'm running here uh, MetaBase version 50, and it's not possible in version, version 50, but it will be possible in version 51 to break out by both week and months. But how will MetaBase know whether the last one is a week or a month? It can differ based on like where in the month you are or like the which week it is. How will it know which value to pull? It's like, at this point, you're like, why am I even doing this? Why do I want to compare a week and a month? Maybe it, a better, maybe a different chart would work better. Maybe I should like look at something like this uh, year over year table uh, chart, but maybe months and week. So uh, just starting to think about whether it makes sense for the data to be in the form that you want your chart to build is already kind of answering the question. Another thing, another common thing that um, you might ask, well, um, like if I want, so here's my trend chart. It shows me April 2026 because it pulls the last value from my data. What if I want to control this? What if I want to add a filter for a month that I put here? I can go to the query builder, add a filter for a month and say, well, for now, I'm just going to say last month. But of course, I can put any months in here. Um, if I click visualize, I well, it now displays the current months, but it doesn't display a comparison. Why doesn't it display a comparison? Because remember, trend chart is just a wrapper around a results table for a time series. What is my results table here? One month. It doesn't have any other data pulling in. And we'll actually solve this problem. Well, there is a way to solve this problem. Whether I'll have time to show it to you or not is, is a different question. But um, so anytime you want to build a chart, think about what is the shape of data that, my, uh, that I need to have for this chart to make sense, and then uh, arrange your query accordingly. And the, there are... Um, Different shapes of data, I talked a little bit about this in the, my previous webinar, depending on what you have in your metrics, so what you have as your sum uh, count, what you have in this metric block, and what you have in the uh, what we call breakout or dimension block. Maybe you already have one dimension because we're working with time series, but you can have another dimension like product category or something. So depending on what you have here, 
uh, different types of charts will be available to you. And uh, um, if you want to build a, for example, stacked bar, bar chart, you know that there has to be something that you get to stack, right? So it has to be either another metric or another dimension. I give you a lot of like uh, kind of encyclopedic overview of uh, um, if you have one metric over time, if you have multiple metrics over time, or if you have a metric and a breakout, what charts are available. And it's it's not kind of, it, it all makes sense, right? If you have two metrics and two breakouts, you can't put it on any chart because you have to have like, one of the dimensions is the actual dimension. Another dimension is the color. One metric is the uh, like point on the on the chart. Where does the second metric go? So if you have two metrics and two uh, breakouts, you need to use something like a pivot table. If you have two metric and two metrics and one breakout, you can plot it as two lines, for example, or you can plot it as uh, nearby bars or uh, or stacked bars, or 100% stacked bars. And uh, like it's it's kind of less important for this webinar. If you want to hear more about this, uh, watch uh, the line and bar charts webinar. But the point is that uh, what chart you're building is determined by the shape of your data and, uh, and the, by the way that your chart behaves. So that's the first point I want to make. Anytime you want to build a chart, think about the shape of the data. Um, the second point I want to make is that uh, all these charts are communicating different things. So um, let's take a look, for example, here. I build a, a couple of charts on the same data set with uh, time dimension and two metrics, right? And uh, I have here um, a two line charts to uh, a combo chart and two different um, trend charts. This is the same data, but they tell us very different things, right? Um, in my, oh, first of all, trend charts just tell us about the what's happening in the current moment. If I look at the uh, line and bar chart, what we have, what we call a combo chart, that just I really kind of it's really emphasizing the size of the bars for me. This is like the, the main thing in this chart, and the line chart is kind of over there for reference. But really, what's the important part of this chart are these bars, so this average of quantity. And if uh, I wanted to say, like look at the seasonal patterns in uh, our order quantity. By the way, this is also how the revenue changes based on that. There is no seasonal pattern in revenue. Isn't that interesting? This is how I would uh, communicate this, right? Because the most important part is these changes in quantity over, over time, but the uh, changes in the purple line, the revenue is kind of like an additional fact. Whereas on the first chart, both are line charts and they're both kind of same importance. And I don't really look at size as much as I'm looking at just the direction. So there are general guidelines and uh, I've written them out for, for you here, but I will also review them in a second about um, what each type of chart emphasizes and how you can use that to your advantage when communicating. For example, a line chart emphasizes evolution and a bar chart emphasizes magnitude. Um, this is applicable for any kind of data, not just for time series. But let's see how to apply this data to make our uh, look into uh, changing trends uh, more useful. Uh, so here I'm looking at a trend chart and it's displaying just the last value. I mean, that that's great. I really like these percentages, right? I really like understanding how much it changed compared to February, how much it changed compared to six months ago. 
uh, I would like to have this not just for the last months, but for all months. Uh, if I look at my, if I, if, if I make it into a line chart, it's just like, I can see the general direction, but, uh, and I can see like the data for every month, but it's very difficult for me to say, like, how does September 2025 compare to September 2024, for example, where even is, oh, there we go. I guessed it. So like, it's very difficult to compare across multiple time periods. Line chart does not provide me with this information. Trend chart provides me only with the very latest update on this information. So how do I say, um, compared to the same time last year, we're performing 50% better, right? And uh, this is where my current favorite MetaBase tool is. I literally stick it into every chart I make, whether it's necessary or not. And that's um, offset. In uh, version 50, so probably the one that most of you are running, we introduced a new custom expression called offset. Uh, I'm going to write out an example of using it, and then I'm going to explain. This is by far like my favorite and most useful for me tool for working with time series. Uh, all right. I will show you what it does and then we'll walk through what it is. Here, here is what this custom expression does. It pulls the data from the previous period into the same row. Remember how I talked to you about that what charts are available is determined by the shape of the data. And the trend chart does this like cool little thing where it analyzes your last record and then looks up previous records. But if I'm not working with a trend chart, how do I tell my chart to look up the records? I have to put them into the data because chart is determined by the data. So this is what the offset function does. It puts the previous results of a metric into the same row, right? And uh, uh, here I do offset sum of total by minus one. So I compute this metric, sum of total, and then offset it by minus one. And you see this uh, difference of uh, one row. And I can offset it by any number. So for example, uh, here, I in the same row, I display the data for May 2022 and April 2022, but I can also display the data for May 2022 and May 2021 if I just offset by 12 months. Uh, and let's uh, look at the larger table over here. So. Uh, well, I have no data prior to 2022, so this is empty. But for April 2023, I now see the data for April 2022. For May 2023, I see the data for May 2022, together with the data for the actual date. If I try to visualize it, say, a line chart, and let me remove all these trend lines, and also let me turn off split y-axis to compare them on the same scale, you can see that it's kind of shifted series. But if I add a filter, let me say, let me just look at the current year or maybe next year. Let's look at 2025 since we're living in the future. All right, so what does this chart display? It displays me, let me, let's look at the results. It displays the uh, sum of total, which is my say, revenue in January 2025, and what was the revenue in the previous year. So let me rename this series. Uh, so let's say this is 2025. And I'll rename it. Can, you, can everyone see my cat? It's very disruptive. His name is Boy, if you're wondering. All right, so here on the same chart, I now have the uh, data for the same month. So for January, March, May, whatever, for 2024 and 2025, 
as two different series. Why is this better than having them on the same line chart? Because I can compare them better. I can even turn this into a bar chart, maybe not stacked bar, bar chart. And I can actually see the change from one year to the next on the same chart for every month in a year. Something that trend chart only did for like the latest months in the data set. Yes, I had to do a little bit of like stuff in here, add an offset. But after I put uh, this offset into my data, I now can compare it on a bar chart. And of course, I can do more. I can do, let me rename this 2024. Uh, I can add another one, do an offset by 24 months, and that will be the, op the two years before, so that's 2023. Um, I will need to select the series, and I'm reordering them a little bit. So now I can compare three years. Uh, this is getting uh, a little bit like a little bit uh, overcrowded. And I, while I can like compare the change within a single year, it's very difficult to me to discern any pattern within this. So maybe I'll just change it back to a line chart. And then I can see uh, kind of, I, I can see generally the same scale, but I can also see the temporal patterns within each year. For example, I can see that each year there is a spike in May 2025, but I can also see that um, my stuff was in 2024 um, was much below the stuff in 2025, but then like the growth kind of uh, slowed down in 2025 compared to the previous year. So uh, I have, so let's, uh, get back to my first point of this webinar is that your chart should communicate one thing this chart communicates very well here are the different patterns uh, across years and i put them in, as different series because it makes it easier to compare than having it as one long line chart uh, this bar chart says uh communicates to me, this is the difference in size for each month, because bar charts really emphasize size more than direction. Um, but maybe I wanted to look at the rate of growth. I see that kind of, I see the, the, great, the growth uh, in 2025 seems to be slowing down. And I can do that too with my magical function offset. Uh, I can, instead of just taking the previous value, I can compute the difference of the previous value. Sorry, not count. Sum of total. Uh, so this is what I'm computing right now. It's the current year minus the value in the previous year. So that's the difference between the value in the same months, but in different years. And then I can divide it by the value in the previous year. Uh, minus 12, there we go. So many parentheses. All right, so this is the percentage difference uh, in 2024 versus 2025. Uh, let's see what we get. So if I now visualize, let me plot this actual percentage difference instead of sum of total. And uh, I'm also, because, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about communicating here, I'm also going to format the values as percentage and maybe put them on, uh, on the chart. So what this says 
And this chart tells me nothing about what the actual value was in uh, 2024 and 2025, but it tells me something about how we're growing. I see in the first couple of months, we were growing really fast compared to the previous year, but in the next few months, the growth slowed down and even was negative at a certain point. All right, so this is effective when comparing rates of growth. So, uh, whether you comparing, um, let me switch to the, whether you comparing just the current state with the state of the past, whether you're comparing it over time, whether you're comparing rate of growth, a different chart would serve this purpose better. Um, so this is all using offset and we're using the function offset because we want to put the data from the previous year into the same uh, um, row as the current year. Uh, in version 20, in version 51, uh, our new uh, beta release, which is currently available, go download it and test it, but don't run it in production. It's, there's actually an easier way to do it because we allow you to break out by um, both year and uh, months, which is kind of a game changer for time over time comparison. But offset function serves a lot of the different purposes, and we'll see a little bit about it later. But for now, I want to move on from comparing a single metric over different time periods to comparing it over different dimensions. So uh, let's say I have a new question. Let me do maybe sum of quantity over time and maybe I'll do some of total I think some of quantity is all right there we go so what I'm doing here is I have a metric and I'm looking at a uh, metric over time but broken out by category. This is also a very, this is like the second most common pattern after looking at evolution of metric over uh, different time periods. But this chart is awful, right? It's like, there's so much going on here. Uh, first of all, I have, well, I have four different colors because I have four different categories. And that's all. That's one piece of information that I need to process. Then there are two dimensions, the time and uh, the uh, actual metric. Then I have a lot of variability in this metric that I also like, is this, is this important? Do I need to track every, every single variable over here? I would not show this chart to anyone, right? The chart that I would make again, depends on what is it that I want to tell people. There are several things you might want to tell with, with this chart. For example, I see that uh, all, these, all these categories, all these four different colored series are kind of growing over time. And maybe that's what I want to tell people. Maybe I have like every department is doing fantastic. They are all growing. I, um, well, it, it's kind of possible to discern it from looking at this chart, but there is a lot of stuff that you need to first notice and then discard in your brain. It introduces a lot of cognitive load, like, oh, actually all this variability is not important. Actually, all these colors are not important. What's important to me is that there are four lines and they all go up, right? So if this is what I want to communicate, let's remove all the unnecessary information. First thing I want to remove is this huge variability from months to months. If I only care about direction, only care like general trend, then let's just smooth out this variability. You might say, well, why not just add a trend line for each series? Now, okay, imagine this and adding four more lines to this chart. That's that th there's already too much going on. So let's not add any more trend lines. And instead, let's try to smooth out the series. Because we only care about direction and not the exact variability, we can replace uh, a value with sort of a moving average 
of the previous value, which will introduce a, a little bit of smoothing over the time series. So I'll go um, back to my thing. And uh, what I want to do is I want to create a different metric that instead of just looking at the sum of total for each category for each month, it will give me the average of this previous months and two months before. Well, how do I do that? If only someone told me about a function that can give me the value for the previous months. So I'm going to say for each month, I'm going to have my sum of total. Um, I'm going to then offset it the same sum uh, by now I just want to offset by one month. I don't want to look at the previous year minus 12 months. I want to compute moving average over the last three months. And uh, I'm and I forgot a parenthesis again. And uh, I'm going to do minus two. There we go. And I'm going to call it three months moving average. Uh, let's check it out. By the way, if you are running version 15, um, if you want to use offset with the breakout by category, this is the order uh, that you need to put your breakouts in. So first the uh, dimension, the time dimension, then the category. In version 51, we remove this limitation and you can put these in any order. Again, version 51, download it, try it out. Uh, let us know if there are any bugs. So I visualize, let me go to settings and, uh, okay, so here is my original series, right? So um, noisy, very difficult to read. And now I will change the metric. So the Y axis, I will change it to my moving average. It's sort of the same data, but a little bit smoothed out, which I'm doing because I don't care about the exact values. I just care about the direction. This is already significantly easier to read because it removed this additional load of do I need to track every value. Now there is still a little bit of variability, but there is a lot less to pay attention to. In fact, if I was maybe putting this on a dashboard, I'd think Metabase very helpfully made these series very distinct colors so I could distinguish them and read this chart, but I don't care about distinguishing them. I care about showing that they're all going in the same direction. So maybe I will actually make them slightly less distinguished. Something maybe like purple, blue, uh, teal, a different purple. Uh, maybe I'll make this one teal and this one purple. Something like this, where it's like, it's not no longer green and red and yellow, very different, but it's kind of like, they're all close. They're still different. They're still distinguishable if you wanted them to. And you can always, by the way, hover over a series to see uh, which one is it, right? But that's not the point of the chart. The point of the chart, they're all going up. In fact, if uh, I was uh, even uh, more controversial, I could even remove more information from this chart. Like, I don't need uh, these uh, labels. I can just have a good title. Uh, like, that's not a very good title. Uh, but then I don't need, if I, if I give my chart a good title, I don't, I no longer need uh, the labels. And I don't even really need these uh, grid lines because I don't particularly care whether it's 30,000 or 40,000. I care about showing that they're all growing. So removing the grid lines just focuses on what is the message of this chart, that uh, it, our revenue is growing across all categories. So that could be one thing you wanted to communicate with that original bad chart. Um, but you might want to communicate something very different. You might want to say, Actually, yes, all of them are growing, but look at this one, which is uh, Duhiki. It's growing much, much uh, slower than the other ones. Maybe there is a concern. Uh, then I would do slightly different. Maybe I'll put back 
the grid lines to just see the scale of the difference between the grow size. And maybe uh, instead of using these kind of similar colors for all of them, I would have a very saturated color for Duhiki, uh, maybe something less so for other. I actually, actually, I can make everyone else the same color. And I can also adjust the line size, make Duhiki very bold and make everyone else very small because I care about highlighting one particular series and the rest, again, the exact values are not that important. What's important about how this one series relates to the bulk of the rest. So I highlight one series and I leave the rest kind of like in the background. Again, this way, when I see this chart, this is what I see. I don't need to uh, read a little text box next to the chart that's telling me what I should learn from it because the chart is itself telling me this. Um, so here's a, let me start a new question. I don't wanna save these. I don't wanna have these settings uh, saved. So I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna start from scratch again. So uh, another thing that you might want to communicate with this uh, same chart is not really about the direction, but maybe you want to tell us that uh, all our product categories are kind of the, taking up the same, have about the same revenue. Um, and that's the important part. Yes, it's growing, but it's like, the share of each of the series is more or less the same. Then this does not, again, communicate this very well because what 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 should I be looking at? Instead, I can switch visualization, for example, to the area chart. I could even switch it to a 100% area chart if I did not particularly care about the growing revenue. But I will I will st stick to the just the stacked area chart and here on this chart, what I first see is the area, is how much area each of these product categories is taking. And I immediately see that it's about equal. So that's the first thing that I get from this chart. And uh, that's, uh, sorry, my cat is trying to step on my keyboard. There we go. And uh, so I use this uh, area chart if I want to communicate proportion. Um, another thing that you might want to communicate with this chart is, uh, let's say you have a goal that every department has to hit. Like you, you are expecting them to have like the same performance. So, uh, the area chart was emphasizing that they have the same share of revenue. Uh, but maybe that's expected. That's not a novel insight but you want them all to hit the same goal. Um, maybe let's put at a goal line and add a goal of like 12,000 or something. Maybe let's be nicer to do hickeys and put the goal as at 10,000. All right, so, um, maybe 11. <laughs> there we go. So uh, here uh, I have a goal. It's like my department-wide KPI. I want every department, department of gadgets, department of gizmos to hit this goal of 11,000 every month. Obviously, I can see that some months we're hitting that goal, some months we're not, and the hickeys are pretty much never doing this. But how do I get this information? I have to sit there and like, okay, maybe I'm going to hover over one chart. Look at this. Uh, all right. Then I'm going to hover over the next one. Maybe I'm going to, by the way, in version 51, you can click on the legend to hide the series, which is literally my favorite thing in the world. Uh, but um, in, in this version I'm running, it's not implemented yet. So like it's, it's, it's annoying. It requires me, the person using the dashboard to go and do something. I don't want to do anything. I just want to, I just want to tell you what I should think. Uh, so 
one of the things uh, I can do here is uh, to, well, one of, one of maybe re things I can do is to just look at unstacked bar chart. So that's one thing I can do. Um, that, why am I looking at unstacked bar charts? Remember, I'm telling, I, I was telling you how bar charts really emphasize the size, whether, whereas line charts emphasize direction. If I want to look at the size, so how is it related to um, my goal? So bar chart is, is a good option. It's a little too noisy. Like there are a lot of bars. Um, I can probably zoom in on like a relevant period of information. Obviously my goal wasn't always 11,000, right? Because I was never hitting it before. So it's probably happened somewhere around here that the goal of 11,000 was introduced. So I could zoom in on a relevant period. Um, but it's still like, there's still a lot of information. So the question then that you should ask yourself, what is it that I'm, so what is it that I want to present here? Do I want to present whether a certain department is hitting a goal in a certain month or um, how much are they over or what is important? So for example, I could go and just say, instead of sum of total, let me do maybe sum of total uh, minus 11,000. So it's a difference with the goal. So instead of plotting uh, the actual values, I'm going to plot difference with the goal uh, by category. And I don't need my uh, goal line anymore because, um, did I put, oh, I put, too many zeros. There we go. All right. So this chart is already telling me something. Uh, I'm saying that one category is definitely always below the goal because I see like this mass of green bars below zero. Um, I see that uh, probably I, I see that my orange category, whatever it is, is very frequently significantly above the goal. My purple category is like a little closer to the goal. So this chart is better. I can get more information by just glancing at it. But um, maybe there is still like a little bit too much. So what I could do, and what, why is there too much information, right? Because I'm using this color for category but I also have a dimension of the metric and I also have um, uh, the time dimension and I also have like the notion of hitting or not hitting the category. That's too many things to keep track of, even if it's still better than my previous charts. So when I have this many things that I want to put on the same chart, um, I can use a pivot table. So uh, let's say I let me introduce a new variable. So uh, let me add maybe a custom column that says. Actually, I'm not even going to do that. Uh, I think I'm just going to let me make it into a pivot table. Where is my pivot table? There we go. And I'm not even, I don't even need the difference with the goal here. Here's, here's why. Uh, this happens. There we go. Um, so the, this is the same information. It's unreadable right now, right? It's, it's a lot of numbers. That's why I uh, generally, don't like tables and pivot tables in particular, it just dumps a bunch of numbers on you. And it's like, if you look at this, it's just like, I have to look at every single number and compare it to every single other number to be able to get some information. 
obviously that's like the worst way to present something. But in Metabase, you have this conditional formatting option and you can add a rule. For example, uh, you can uh, add a rule for to, to, color, to color values uh, from white to more green, depending on how much they exceed my goal. So I start my range at 11,000. And uh, I have this range of colors that gets more intense as my um, um, number gets bigger and bigger compared to 11,000. So I can do this and I can add another rule and another color range. But now I'm going to add a bad color range where I'm going to look at ending at 11,000. And I think I need to do uh, ah, I managed them to, hmm. Smart. Hmm. What did I do? One second. <laughs> I wanted to rebuild the chart that I made, which was this. Oh, all right. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to say that just if, uh, if my column is less than my goal of 11,000, I'm going to color it red. There we go. All right. So what this chart is telling me with these colors is that I don't really need to read the numbers. I can just look at the colors, right? I can see pretty much the entire Duhiki column is red. It's never hitting the goal. Uh, I can see all the others have like their bad months, but they have their good months. For example, August 2025 was a good month for at least two of my departments. I can see the gadget department doing really well. A lot of uh, big green numbers. I never actually look at the numbers themselves. I just look at the color. And that was possible because in the bar chart, color was another dimension. Here, my dimensions are literally tables, are literally table dimension, like columns and rows. So I free up color to have meaning, not just for like distinguishing series, but to communicate meaning. So even though it's a table, which is the worst possible visualization for communication, by adding color to it, I can do things like say, well, this department is performing very well. And I never have to read it as 15,017 for August 2025. All right. I think I am five minutes over what I planned for, <laughs> for this session, but only five minutes. And I covered almost everything. So. Um, let me stop over here. Uh, again, two points that I wanted to communicate is that the way you build your chart is determined by the shape of your data. So think about what your data should be shaped like before you start building your chart. And if something goes wrong, maybe something is wrong with your shape. And uh, every chart should try to communicate a single thing. And uh, if it's communicating more than a single thing, maybe just build several charts. So I'm going to stop right there and uh, give an opportunity to ask uh, questions.